Well, as I mentioned, our next presenter will also be here uh, throughout the weekend. Uh, and we're thrilled to have uh, Professor David Highland from Xavier University. And Dave's going to be talking about confidence intervals and statistical difference tests. So, David, I know you got a great presentation for these folks, so take it away. Uh, thanks, Scott. Uh, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Can't see you yet. Where are you? There you are. Yeah, there we go. Okay, super. Well, thanks. So, um, like Scott said, I'm Dave Highland. I'm a professor at Xavier University, and the <clears throat> the talks you've had so far have been great. Um, and I think this is a nice progression on this one. Uh, what we're basically going to talk about is what to do, what to do with the data once once you've got it. And the name of the name of the presentation is confident or confidence intervals and statistical difference tests. And so we're going to play around with those. And and one of the things I, I like the subtitle here: why we don't need robo coaches. So. What I think we're going to, you know, hopefully your conclusion at the end will be, there's a lot of, you know, there's some things we can play with, but it only gives part of the picture. A lot of the statistics we look at don't tell us everything, um, and we need to think about what it is that we're actually, what it is we're actually measuring and testing, and what are the limitations. So let's jump into it. So a little background about me. I'm a finance professor, and I got to talking, one day I was talking to our uh, business analytics chair, and I told him, I said, you know, the problem with statistics is you just keep jumping from data set to data set, and you never understand half the data sets you're playing with. And boy, wouldn't it be awesome if you did statistics just with something you really know, like baseball, which which is awesome. And he said, okay, start teaching it then. And, and so I had, to, I had to put my money where my mouth is. And I started teaching the Saber Metrics class. Um, the class is uh, a lot of our programming. We try to apply statistics, but everything we do is baseball. And uh, I think kind of brings statistics to life a little bit. And it's a lot of fun. In the process, we had students that started to get interested in this stuff. And so we started Expat, the Xavier Baseball Analytics team. And uh, I bring this up because a lot of you are in organizations, whether it's college or high school, where you could start doing start doing analytics work there. I mean, there's 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 all kinds of data these these days. Whether it's whether it's collected, uh, you know, we get a lot of data through through Synergy and six four three charts and, and so on, but but you can also collect a lot of data as well. And the other thing I'll throw out, I'm a minority partner with the Florence Yalls, uh, an uh, independent minor league team. And uh, we're in Florence, Kentucky. And, you know, teams like that are always looking for people to work on stuff. Now, you know, it's a place to get your get your feet wet. They don't tend to pay a lot, but it, it's something, um, something to think about. Anyway, the, the the picture up in the right, I throw in here. I'm a big Reds fan. Uh, this is this is actually me with Ted Glazuski um, at one of his camps a long, long, long time ago. Um, so here we go. Here wanted to get into the meat of the uh, meat of the presentation, and what we're going to do is look at the basic one of the one of the early things you learn in your statistics classes are confidence intervals and statistical difference tests and we're going to start with proportions and essentially the the gist of confidence intervals if we have an estimate let's say p hat so think batting average on base percentage some kind of some kind of measure zero one measure. Do you get on base or not? Do you get a hit or not? Well, based on our sample size and how confident we want, we can create confidence intervals to say, okay, based on your sample, we can infer that the mean is somewhere between p hat, your observation, minus 
this term and plus this term. And the term, our Z value is from uh, a standard normal table. We're gonna we're going to uh, pick based on how confident we want to be that our estimate is within the range. Notice the big thing here is is n the bigger the sample size you have, the bigger sample size you have, the more confident you're going to be that the the sample you've drawn represents the the actual mean or the actual uh, uh, average you're trying to find out. We can also, you know, essentially rearrange some things and calculate a difference in. Uh, you know, uh, one, our sample and our hypothesized uh, population to test whether the, the sample is likely to be statistically different than the, the overall po population or, uh, or another player, for example. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to apply confidence intervals and statistical difference tests. We're mostly going to focus on hitting here. Um, the idea is to get you to think about how to take these, how to take these concepts that you have in your statistics class and apply them in a baseball setting. Once you've collected data from, uh, you know, some of these sources that we had in our earlier presentations. So the data I'm going to use is, uh, you know, data from the Laman database. Uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I probably couldn't teach my course without uh, Sean Laman's database. So it was really cool to see him as the first presenter of the day. I don't do a lot of SQL stuff. I do, I do most everything in our in our studio. Uh, so it's cool seeing him do some of that stuff. Um, one thing that that you, that's that the Laman database doesn't have is uh, observations against left-handed hitters, right-handed hitters, and individual pitchers. So I'm I'm going to use RetroSheet to measure some of the righty-lefty matchups and matchups against uh, individual pitchers. I'm also going to at the very end I'm going to talk. We've got we've got hit tracks, which is which is uh, uh, basically lab data. You basically, you run in a batting cage, uh, when, when, uh, players hit on hit tracks, it's, it's kind of like playing a video game. It measures, it, it measures hypothetically how far the ball would go, how hard it's hit, bunch of different observations. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit at the end. So that's the data I've used. And so you know, framing framing the situation, what what we're trying to um, accomplish is I, I'm going to put the setting as the uh, American League Championship Series. You've got Aaron Boone trying to decide uh, what batting decisions, batting order, who to bat, et cetera, in order to beat the Astros. Um, so let's back up just a little bit and talk about some of the sabermetric concepts. Um, one of the big things that 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 most sabermetrics courses start with is um, run differential, and this is just a graph of team win loss percentage. So the win loss percentage is on the vertical axis, and run differential is on the horizontal axis. So if we think about the the point right here about in the middle where teams score about the same number of runs as they give up. On average, they have a, a, a winning percentage about uh, 50%. Not surprising, you, you give up as many as you score, you probably win some, lose some, finish about, finish about 50%. But we've got a pretty strong relationship. The more runs you score, the higher, more runs you, the, the higher the run differential runs you give up, versus runs you don't, uh, the, the, the higher your higher your winning percentage is going to be. Certainly we have outliers, but but it plots uh, pretty soon. So for for our purpose, thinking about putting together uh, 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 I, I saw the comment about the Yankees fan turning into torture. Sorry about that. Uh, 
Um, so anyway, that the the, uh, the 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 objective is obviously to score more runs. So the next question: How do we score more runs? We look at uh, we look at what statistics are correlated with runs. And you know the the big the big money ball observation is that uh, uh, or the story the fun story in there is that uh, Billy Bean felt like uh, players with on base percentage were less higher on base percentage were less expensive and on base percentage is more correlated with runs than batting average um, slugging even more OPS more we could look at things like woba even more um, so anyway we're going to start with we're going to start with on base percentage just to keep it simple um, on base percentage highly correlated with runs so let's look at it and so whenever we want to whenever we and whenever we start to play with data one of the things we want to do is, is graph it what does on base percentage look like and mm -hmm. and here is uh the 2022 season we took all the players with over 100 plate appearances and just plotted plotted their on base percentage we see here that the average is about 319 the median, I didn't put the actual observation on, very close to the mean, um, you know, looks somewhat normal, which is going to allow us to, which is going to allow us to use um, these confidence intervals, making some normality assumptions. Have to warn a little bit, I am not a statistics professor, so I am more interested in, you know, what can we do to apply here? Uh, some of the statistics aren't necessarily going to be perfect, and there might be some flaws, but let's try to use it. So when we think about statistics and we think about some of these concepts, we're sort of thinking about a player as a distribution. So if we think about 2022, Aaron Judge had an on-base percentage of 425. So we look back at our graph, 425 puts, you know, he obviously had a great season. We know he set the American League record for a home run. So fantastic season. But the question is, if you're Aaron Boone and you're, you're putting your lineup together and you're thinking about uh, Aaron Judge, the 425 is what he did. What I'm interested in is what he's going to do. So if we think about if we think about 2025, we think about this. I've got a I've got an image of a jar of marbles, right? And if we think of the player as a distribution, and you know, I want to caution there. We'll, we'll talk about some of the problems with thinking about players as distributions. If we think about them as a jar of marbles. Any particular at bat, I reach into the jar. Um, if I pull out a red marble, that's an out. If I pull out a green marble, that's a single. If I pull out a, a blue blue marble, that's a home run. So, um, you know, players players obviously are not distributions. But when we when we start to use these st statistical concepts, um, that's essentially the 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 the, the way we want to think about this. Now, it might be too simple to think about the player all by himself as a distribution. Uh, I've got, I, 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 you know, probably most of you guys are too young to uh, remember this game. It's, it's still out there. Some people maybe play called Stratomatic Baseball. And essentially what Stratomatic Baseball did was create batter cards and hitter cards. And to play the game, you set down the batter card, in this case, Joe Morgan uh, from, from the 70s against John, John Candelaria, a really good pitcher for the Pirates. You roll three die, the first die is red. You look one through six, uh, whatever the dice is. If it's a one through three, you go to the player card. If it's a four through six, you go to the pitcher's card, and then the sum of the next two die is um, the result. So if I roll a 1-8, that goes to Joe Mar Morgan's batter card, and 
the result is a home run. Um, if I if I do a uh, four roll of four seven, the result is on the pitcher's card and is a strikeout. So the the you know the the realism in the game is that you've got a distribution for the batter, a distribution for the pitcher, and there's some interaction. You know, obviously in this case it's 50-50. I'm sure people have done papers to uh, to to decide uh, what it is. I don't I don't have any specifics, but we can think about either a distribution as a single player. If I'm thinking about that player against an average pitcher, or maybe I think about a distribution against a specific pitcher. So let's think specifically. Uh, Aaron Boone has to think about matchups. Who's going to play against Justin Verlander? So in this case, you know, we're going to focus on some of the six biggest uh, Yankees hitters. I've got John Carlos Stanton, Aaron Judge, Aaron Hicks, uh, Josh Donaldson, Joey Gallo. Maybe I've named them all. They're, they're all on the they're all on the list. Um, uh, I I have a student that's a big Mets fan, and I really couldn't help but uh, uh, throw this this meme in. Uh, I apologize to uh, any of uh, any of you Mets fans out there. Um, I just couldn't couldn't help myself. It was just kind of funny. I don't actually think this is going to be the case this year. Uh, I think the Mets are going to be pretty fun to watch. Uh, so let's think about these these Yankees that we're we're we're, we're focused on. We've got the six big hitters for the Yankees, and we went went and measured what was their on-base percentage against Justin Verlander for their years, for their career. And so if I look, I've got, I've got Josh Donaldson leading the pack with a 455 OBP. I've got Joey Gallo at 216, Aaron Rizzo at three, Anthony Rizzo at 333. Some of the, you know, Judge and Stanton pretty low down here. So, you know, my first blush might be, geez, you know, Josh Donaldson might be the guy to really bad high or do something with. But then let's look down at the bottom. I've got all of the plate appearances down there. So Anthony Rizzo, having come from the National League, not played with against Verlander very much, only three plate appearances. Joey Gallo, who'd played in the same division with the Rangers, uh, 37 plate appearances. So maybe a little more um, information there. So let's put confidence intervals around it to see what, you know, the statistical guidance would be on these. So our confidence interval math, we're going to focus on, let's put a 90% confidence interval so we'll use 1.64 for our Z statistic. Our, our p-value or our probability will be the on-base percentage that they actually achieve versus Verlander times one minus their on-base percentage against Verlander. And then N is the number of plate appearances. Now, I probably should use T stats here, but you'll see it's not really going to matter. As soon as I put uh, confidence intervals around these guys, I see that, uh, you know, for the most part, they really all overlap. So we're saying, well, Josh Donaldson in his 11 plate appearances has an on-base percentage of 455. But, you know, the true value, you know, 90%, I'm only 90% confident. So that true value is somewhere between, say, 240 and you know, 700, you know, huge confidence, huge uh, range of where, you know, the information guides me for Rizzo and so on. So, um, you know, I think pretty quickly we can throw out uh, this concept of looking at matchups. One of the things that uh, when I when I was looking at uh, putting the examples together, uh, Verlander was the Astro that had had the most uh, appearances against these guys. A lot of the other Astros pitchers were pretty young. There weren't really there weren't really that many. So this is the guy that that had the most, you know, face to face matchups against these guys. 
and yet I really can't get any information out of it. Um, if you're really into this concept of matchups, one of the papers last year by Xander Schwartz might be worth going back and, and watching. He uh, His paper was called Improving Batter Pitcher at Bat Modeling Using K-Means Clustering and, and uh, Mixture Models. So one of the things he tries to do is find matchups that 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 combine guys that that look similar. Uh, so that might be something interesting. But I think for our purposes, when we when we hear these discussions on uh, television and radio about, hey, this guy is 455 against Justin Verlander. Yeah, OK, great. But I'm really not confident that that's any different than the 111 that uh, John Carlos Stanton's hit against him. Yeah, these are actual results. But if I'm trying to figure out what they're going to do next time, not a lot of guidance here from a confidence interval standpoint. So instead, let's look at uh, careers. So in careers, I just go back to 2015 and I break out uh, confidence intervals against right-handed hitters. And I can see that, so, so essentially we're going back, we're, we're taking guys, guys career at bats against right-handed pitchers beginning with 2015. We see that Hicks, Donaldson, Judge, and Rizzo you know, appear to dominate Joey Gallo and John Carlos Stanton. The confidence intervals are all significantly higher. But again, I'm not a lot of guidance uh, on these four, even though we're getting quite a bit, quite a bit of plate appearances. So what's going on here? Well, let's think about it. I mean, the difference between uh, if we look at uh, if we look at John Don Josh Donaldson at 318 versus Anthony Rizzo at 3333, you know, we're just saying of a thousand marbles in the jar, if these guys are jars, right? And their true on base percentage is 333 and 315. Out of a thousand marbles, Rizzo has 18 more hits uh, than Hicks, right? So we're put when we put confidence intervals around them, we see that they're they're much they're much, uh, you know, there's a lot of overlap. And so maybe I don't want to do a lot with this information. Let's look at left-handed hitters. We definitely start to get, uh, we get some gaps. Rizzo and Judge appear to be uh, better than Gallo, but boy, there's a lot of overlap when we look at uh, left-handed, uh, you know, careers against left-handed hitters. So then the question becomes, should I be going back to 2015? Well, I look at, you know, I think that the point of this chart, I graphed everybody's, I graphed everybody's on base percentage by year from 2015 to today. You see, there's a lot of crossover. There are a lot of, a lot of noise here, which makes me think, you know, really should I be, you know, is the distribution, so if I'm thinking of Aaron Judge, if I'm thinking of each of these guys as a hitting distribution, should I be using the last eight years of data? Uh, another thing to look at, um, I know uh, uh, Sean in the next, uh, in the last presentation recommended analyzing baseball data with R, and I'm going to pl put a plug in for that as well. Uh, I this is how I learned R in our studio and all the graphs and all the things you're seeing in this uh, presentation uh, were done in R. And uh, so I strongly recommend it. I think it's a, it's a great resource. Kind of treat it like a cookbook, uh, set it down. And, and uh, I think I think one of the uh, concepts they call uh, learning the hard way. You even though the chapter makes sense, you you you. Uh, you, you type it out, you make the mistakes in the code, you fix the code, and you keep going. You, you end up learning a lot as well. But the one thing that I, the, the page I, I'm copying here from this book is on career trajectories, which um, kind of shows that, uh, you know, 
you know, players, players' careers, we don't necessarily expect them to, uh, in this case, it's looking at OPS, but we can look at a lot of different statistics. Uh, players probably aren't the same distribution uh, from, you know, as they go throughout the career. So what I did is I just looked at uh, the last two years, uh, each of these guys versus versus lefties. And and again, we get quite a bit of overlap, not any clear guidance. You know, Anthony Rizzo, 321 versus lefties, Joey Gallo, 262. But I can't say statistically that I think Anthony Rizzo is necessarily better than Joey Gallo. Could just be, uh, it just could be the, the uh, draws out of the, out of the thing. We've got more plate appearances against right-handers. Uh, Aaron Judge starts to starts to dominate some of these guys. So uh, we look at that 332. Uh, I think it's it's close to higher, if not at least higher than Gallo and, and Stanton. So again, looking at 2021, 2022. Our confidence intervals don't necessarily give us the uh, a lot of confidence that that should be, you know, deciding factors. So we've looked at we've looked at confidence intervals. We've started with some individual map matchups, and we've said, well, you know, we probably should throw those out out of hand. Really can't narrow things down. If I start to look at the last couple of years, I get I get some better better data to consider. Let's think about some situations where where uh, the <clears throat> math might help us. So here's 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 the you know we're we're sticking with Judge uh, in 2022. He had four his OPP was 425 and 696 plate appearances. And in the postseason, 184 and 30, 38 plate appearances. So how do we think about those two distributions? So in the postseason, he was 184 and 38 plate appearances. So in 38 of plate appearances, we would expect, even with 99% confidence interval, I'm sorry, Based on his regular season of 425, we would expect his OBP to be somewhere between 282 and 632 in 38 of plate appearances. So if we think about if we think about this Pope season, this is definitely outside the confidence interval. And what does that mean? Well, we can do a difference in proportions test where we take, you know, we say, well, let's assume that this that 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 his his uh, his uh, <clears throat> uh, true bat true true on base percentage is four twenty five, and his postseason is one eighty four. Are we? Our Z test tells us that we're highly, highly, it's a highly statistically confident that those are not from the same distribution. So what should we think about that? Well, one, you know, it's 38 plate appearances, but what else is going on? Is he is he worn out from the regular season, from, from all the pressure of breaking the American League record? Is he slightly injured? Or the other thing to think about is the postseason uh, pitching he's facing is nothing like the postseason or the regular season. Yeah, he's he's probably faced some pitchers like Verlander and some of the league's best in the regular season, but he also faced pitchers from the Tigers and other teams that weren't overly overly sound. So should we really expect? Should we really expect the postseason to have the same kind of distribution for batting performance as uh, the regular season? So again, it gives us caution. Should we be treating players like distribution? Should we be doing a comparison 
on what does uh, postseason look like versus regular season and so on. Let's think of another case where um, um, confidence intervals and uh, small samples get us in trouble. So this story is in um, Swing Kings, and I think it might it might also be in the MVP machine. But the story of J.D. Martinez. So J.D. Martinez in 2013 with the Astros, and this was this is uh, this is tanking Astros. This is pre pre uh, 2000 um, pre World Series Astros. So. Uh, J.D. Martinez hit 272, his OBP was 272, and 310 plate appearances. So our, uh, <clears throat> our uh, confidence interval range puts him somewhere, you know, his true on-base percentage is 231 to 313. Uh, for 20 plate appearances, 109 to 435. So the story is, uh, the story is that, uh, J.D. Martinez uh, worked with the work with the hitting coach. They they talk a lot about in this uh, book, the Swing Kings. Went and played in uh, Venezuela, really played well there. Came back to Astros Astros spring training, and in twenty plate appearances, his on base percentage was two fifty. So right in the range of what you would expect, and uh, the Astros let him go. A um, few days later, the Tigers picked him up. He spent a few weeks in AAA, called up to the major league club and hit, uh, had an OBP of 358 in 480 plate appearances. So if we do the, if we do the um, statistical difference uh, test, 358 versus 272, we're, here's a case we're about 100% confident that J.D. Martinez was actually a very different player in 2014 than he was in 2013, and that the, the things that he did in the offseason really worked. And, uh, you know, once we get a big enough sample beyond the spring training, uh, the Tigers were able to uh, um, capitalize on that. So what else? So let's think about we've we've talked about these confidence intervals and some of the some of the uh problems we get and you know we we don't we you know really we've got a data problem and um so what do we do what do you know you know how do we go about this and and um um so I'll tell the story of one of our, our players from last year uh this is this is Luke Franzoni um he was uh you know, regular season uh, D1 first or second in home runs had a had a really great had a really great season, and uh, but what happened midway through the season? He had food poisoning and missed a series, and his backup played and just had a crazy good weekend. You know, like went something like 16 for 18, uh, kind of won the starting DH job. Um, then later in the season, if you were thinking, do I want to maybe put this back up in at first base, you know, statistically, when we looked at their uh, confidence intervals, and not, not that our coach was actually looking at this, just this is more of a thought exercise, um, you know, they, they didn't look that different statistically based on their game data. But what we could do is we could look at their hit tracks data. And uh, hit tracks is our indoor and, and, you know, basically, you know, 12 weeks early in the season, we'd hit a, hit a lot in the, in the cage. And uh, we had, so I'm going to focus on this barrel percentage, which is uh, hard hit balls between I think 10 and 25 degree launch angle. So uh, Franzoni had a 27% barrel rate versus 14% for the team. But notice, uh, notice in in you know just twelve weeks, eight hundred and sixty seven observations. You can also see that you know max distance for the team was set by this player. He's also working in the cage all the time. 
So when we do a statistical difference test on the player versus the average player on the team, we're highly confident that he's very different from the average team member from a perspective of hitting the ball in the cage hard. That along with some of our point estimates and some of the others certainly left us to think that, you know, by far he was, he was the guy at first base. Um, the Angels thought so as well. And, you know, we're hoping, we're hoping that Luke has a, has a great, uh, great future and makes it up to the MLB. But, you know, my point is, uh, you know, as fans, we see a lot of game data, but teams are going to have a lot more data. It's not the same as, as game data, but it's supporting information as well. Now I'm going to shift gears just a little bit. Uh, I've been working on confidence intervals with uh, proportions. We can also use confidence intervals with, with um, uh, sample points that are not, that are not um, proportions. For example, uh, slugging percentage. Uh, if you think about slugging percentage, our numerator is uh, single plus two times doubles, plus three times triples, plus four times home runs. So we can take an average of the numerator, which same as dividing by at bats, and the standard deviation of uh, that observation and divide by the square root of the observations. And we can build um, confidence intervals around slugging percentage as well. So uh, we can do confidence intervals and statistical difference tests for proportions, but um, we can also uh, uh, do it for point estimates like slugging percentages or amount of home runs in a season or home runs per plate appearances. But anyway, this is the, this is the slugging percentage distribution Um, again, I took, I took, uh, all players with over a hundred plate appearances. We noticed the data is a little, little skewed to the right. We've got some extreme observations out here, like, uh, <coughs> Aaron judge. Um, so when we build confidence in we can build confidence intervals around slugging percentage as well. So this is each of these guys' career slugging percentage against lefties. Um, you know, we can see John Carlos Stanton looks incredibly good once we start looking at uh, slugging percentage in a longer period of time. And then against uh, righties, uh, Aaron Judge looks incredibly, incredibly good as well. So uh, you kind of race through this pretty fast, but uh, when we look at individual statistical claims, uh, we need a lot and a lot of game data to make, make differences. A lot of the reason is because uh, we're looking at guys that uh, sort of economically, the difference between a 333 on base percentage and a 300 plate is, is Thirty-three marbles in a jar of a thousand, right? So uh, economically, uh, these guys are pretty close. I mean, the fact that we're going out three decimals and on base percentage, batting average, and all these things might be too much to really think about, right? When we think about forecasting, we also need to be incredibly careful about thinking of players as distributions. Players have injuries. There are aging issues, there are real world problems, there are situations uh, uh, they're in. Uh, so when we conclude on this, yeah, it's fun to play around with st statistics and it, it's good, but it's also really important to understand some of the uh, limitations. So if you think back, my title was uh, why we don't need uh, robo umps. Um, I think there's still a lot, you know, I think that some of the statistical concepts can help us with decisions and help frame them. But I think we're still at a point where uh, we need good humans, we need eye tests, we need all that to work as well. 
So I want to thank everybody for listening. I know I went through that really fast, uh, but I, I'm happy to take some questions. And I see uh, Ben asks, is uh, analyzing baseball data with R a good book? If you have zero knowledge on, on R, I would, I, I think so. That's, it's how I learned the book starts with, um, the book starts with, you know, how to install R, how to install R Studio. Uh, it talks, it uses a lot of the database, like the, the Laman database, retro sheet. Um, so some of the chapters are pretty advanced, but but in particular, the first uh, four or five are, are really good for, um, uh, I, I would say, for beginners. And my course is, at Xavier is basically, for most of our students, the beginning R class students have. So, um, you know, they they seem to do okay with it. Uh, any other recommendation for uh, reading material? Um, uh, yeah, I love Bill James. Uh, I love the Bill James handbook. I'm looking over here at the uh, uh, shelf, uh, the book, Playing Percentages in Baseball. I think that's kind of the Bible for anybody that is uh, interested in this stuff. The, the, the book introduces the 24 base out states. So we think about baseball as, you know, at any given time, you either start with nobody on, nobody out, uh, or bases loaded, two outs. There are 24 different states you can start a play at and then you end up. So I think the, the book should be required reading for everybody interested in, uh, in Saber metrics. I like the Bill James handbook. Uh, I like Keith Law's Smart uh, Baseball. Uh, the MVP machine uh, is really good. Um, obviously, Moneyball. Um, a lot, a lot, lot, lots of good ones out there. So, um, let's see. So, uh, the question on confidence intervals using R. Uh, I basically calculated me. I, I did a, re a really clunky way. Um, I calculated R. I calculated the uh, uh, on base percentage, and then I used the uh, I used the formula to uh, let's see if I can put it up here. Yeah, let's see. I used the uh, I calculated the on base percentage plus 1.64 times uh, the on-base percentage times one minus divided by N. So, so really simple. Uh, so I just used, created a, a, a on-base percentage, low on-base percentage, high on-base percentage, and I graphed those with box plots. Um, so Gabby asked, how can we use uh, confidence intervals to know if a proportion or result we find is, is significant and actually matters? Um, you know, essentially, if I if I look at these if, if I look at these overlapping confidence intervals, I'm basically saying that you know I'm not confident in this case that Aaron Judge and John Carlo Stanton are really different against lefties, right? So. So it's not really giving me the answers here. Um, so, you know, have to have more observations or I need observations like in the case of uh, Aaron Hicks and Aaron Judge. Well, yeah, they don't overlap. So they're statistically different. Um, how can a team take more advantage of data now that all teams are opening up to statistical approaches to line up building and understanding players. You know, I think I think teams are using, you know, they're using a lot of data. I, I think uh, Shauna summed it up well. I think a lot of the biomechanical stuff they're using to help players uh, improve. There's, you know, looking at statistics uh, or biomechanic data. These pitch pitchers that throw this hard are doing this biomechanically. Can we get you to do that? So I, I think that I think teams are using 
uh, a lot of data. I think that um, they don't necessarily, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff's proprietary, so they're not necessarily going to tell you what they're doing. But uh, I think they're they're using it a lot. One of the things that we we've seen is that uh, front offices have a lot more people that um, uh, are identified as data analysis statistics, you know, uh, uh, you know, more of the statistics role than ever before. Um, the baseball revolution uh, by Ben Baumer. And uh, I don't I don't apologize for not having the other guys at the top of my head, but the baseball revolution kind of uh, talks about how, you know, before Moneyball teams had just a handful of analysts slash statistical guys. And now you can look, I mean, the Reds probably have two to three pages of guys on their web, people on their website that uh, are probably more analytical type role. Uh, prediction on robo umps. I I don't I don't have a prediction. I I like the game. I like many games. I'm like much of the game as it is. I like the the efforts to uh, speed it up a little bit. Um, uh, you know, I watch a lot of college baseball. Thing that drives me crazy is the replay. They're going and checking these replays on, um, you know game cameras that there's only, you know, two or three cameras, you know, so um, I don't know on robo umps. Uh, you know, obviously they'll change framing and batter strategy, battery strategy, uh, uh, depending on how it, depending on how it's used, if teams only get a couple challenges, then probably framing will, will still be incredibly important. Um, so Stephanie asked how to best use synergy. Um, you know, one of the things that we 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 did this year that I was amazed uh, how the, our guys love it. We we uh, as we were getting ready for the season to go, we uh, we took uh, we just went into synergy and um, created a, created. A, put all the clips together of everybody's hit from last year and put it on a loop in the batting cage. And um, we, we have another TV where we put a, a loop of every pitcher strikeout. And the idea is just to, to show these guys um, visualizations of themselves succeeding. And I, you know, I think it, it's, it's a hard sport and thinking about ways to, uh, to help players, um, uh, uh you know, be successful and see themselves successful. So we use synergy uh, that way a lot. Our coaches tend to use uh, synergy a lot in scouting. Um, and then, uh, you know, we get some data out of it as well. So that's on synergy. Um, let's say I'm a little lost in questions. Um, Max asks, uh, Max asks, uh, about my favorite, um, uh, <clears throat> differences between, uh, college and, uh, pros. Uh, the thing I love about the college game is the enthusiasm, uh, you know, in a 56 game schedule, uh, you know, every, every game matters, uh, these are guys going to, you know, so the enthusiasm is fantastic. The, the, the play level is fantastic, but it's, it's not the perfect play. Like you, you see on TV with, for the MLB, which those guys are awesome to watch as well. But um, yeah, I like what I like watching the college game. I, I, I so um, Lane asks, is there a defined sweet spot as far as confidence intervals? Uh, yeah, I think it really tends to vary. I mean, you know, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, it, you know, I use 90, just, uh, people don't tend to go much less than 90 when I've, you know, I'm not, not, there might be a better question from a, for a pure stats guy, but a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, 
uh, fields using more like 95, 99. I know a lot of finance journals. I probably, if I only had a couple results that were 90% statistically confident, my paper probably might not get published there. Um, oh, which statistics can be projected with greater confidence? Um, there, uh, Uh, some of the things like um, trying to think there's there's a good there's a good source that really covers like that. And I, I don't have a great answer, uh, but but like a lot of times OBP is better at predicting batting average for the next year than than actually batting averages. So uh, some of those are good. I, I don't. I it's definitely a good question that's answered out there somewhere, but. Um, it's not rolling off the top of my head. How do I think the discrepancy between MLB and college baseball utilizing the analytics will change going into the future? Well, one of the things that we're seeing with college baseball is that more and more teams are getting TrackMan, which is what the MLB used to have. Uh, there's, you know, each play in TrackMan, I think there are something like, I mean, well over 100 uh, observations. So there's really, I think for a lot of the big, big D1 programs, there is a lot of, a lot of analytics going on in game data. In, um, in the practice setting, uh, we have uh, hit tracks, uh, Rapsodo, and um, a portable track man. So there's a lot of analytics that's being used to design design pitches and to, to analyze swings. And to, so I think there is a lot of analytics going on at the college level, at least what I'm seeing. Um, you know, obviously uh, some of the stuff Shauna was talking about where uh, you can start to get biomechanic data based off of some of the track man. I mean, that that that's probably... That's probably a long way off for, for college. Um, Donald asked, does the data have to fit a normal to use the hypothesis testing in interval? You know, that that's where I'm gonna get in trouble because I'm not a statistics professor. I kind of ran the graphs, they look pretty normal. So I, I went ahead and did it. So, uh, you know, I don't have to go back and pass stats. So don't let me get anybody in trouble with their stats professor on that. Um, so I did it. I not sure. I probably for some of the smaller tests I did at the beginning, I probably use should have used T values instead of uh, Z values, but none of them were statistically significant anyway, so they would be even less. Uh, so on. Do I think the MLB should shorten the length of the season? I mean that. Uh, I mean maybe. Um, it's a great question. Um, I think the teams like the money from all the. Um, the different dates, right? I mean, you know, uh, both both television revenue and uh, appearance revenue. So I don't know that I'll see that coming. Um, Will asks, are there any courses you offer online or know of any other online resources? There, um, I think the course out of, um, what's the, uh, I'm drawing a blank. Um, guy out of Boston University, one of those big um, MOOC uh, offers a sabermetrics course that uh, I went through. It's pretty. It's it's pretty well done. Um, he does he does a little of everything. He does some um, SQL. He does some R. Um, covers some good uh, historical. So check that out. I, I I'm just totally drawing a blank on um that online course um but that that's the only one i'm aware oh oh and i should <laughs> uh saber uh is starting to offer some online classes i went through the first one i found it really good entertaining um well done and it covers a lot of the good uh saber concepts so maybe uh when Scott jumps back on here, he can uh, give a plug for that because I thought that was really cool 
And that would probably be where I'd start most, most people. Are we better at predicting postseason stats now more than Moneyball? where the A's were never able to win in World Series. One of my students did a presentation on that uh, as part of his classwork, and um, I'm not sure that uh, I've got a good answer. I'm not sure he had a good answer, and uh, I certainly don't have a great answer on that. But it's, a, it's definitely a great question. It's like uh, uh, Shanna said, you know, if you can put together projects like that and, he's in, 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 and uh, take a crack at answering some of those types of things, um, you know, those are the kind of things that you can uh, show off when you interview with people. So go go try that. I'd I'd love to I'd love to know the answer. David, you uh, you did great. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. It was fun. We really appreciate you being here and you'll be around all weekend. So if, if, if anybody's in person, um, please stop. Yeah, by. look me up. I'll get there. About, I, I decided to present at home because I've got my little studio here. Uh, I'm jumping on the plane tomorrow morning. So don't look for me until uh, tomorrow. <laughs> well, Professor David Island, everybody, thank you so much. Um, 